المحاضرة بتكون مقدمة من قبل الأستاذ مروان شويكي وبالتأكيد مثل دائما مثل ما عودنا المحاضرة بتكون جدا رائعة ونحن متشوقين أن نسمعها مستر مروان you can start شكرا thank you عائشة بارك الله فيك and uh, I would like to thank everyone who is now in the platform of Zoom of SAS platform uh, here, as usual, we try to uh, to deliver the latest news, astronomy, and educational concepts as well uh, through the team of SAS. And also, sometimes we invite uh, people from outside to uh, to have rich, even uh, astronomical platform. Uh, now. Uh, I think this is maybe the first time we ever talk about uh, exomoons. We always talk about exoplanets, which is extrasolar planets, Kawakib uh, Najmiya. That's very confusing actually in Arabic, to be honest. Sometimes, which is which equivalent to out, uh, outer planets. Al-Kawakib Kharijiyya is already used outer planets, but uh, what I would prefer to use Al-Kawakib al najmiya which is planets that uh, related to the stars, which is uh, closer to the English term exo solar uh, extrasolar planets or exoplanets. Now we are not talking about exo exoplanets, but we are talking about exomoons. But before that, even I need to uh, just to brief you with this, with the, the basic informations about exoplanets. If we cannot understand how to detect exoplanets, then it will not be uh, easy or it will be difficult to understand how to detect exomoons because we almost use the same uh, techniques, the same methods that we use to observe or to detect the exoplanets, but with different uh, considerations. Uh, I I hope you would enjoy with me uh, this new topic uh, taking place at SAST. Uh, before we start, let's just uh, remember that there are more than 220 moons in our solar system, moons or satellites. Which, of course, we talk about natural satellites, not artificial ones. Therefore, ex, uh, exomoons could be very common everywhere. This is a hint. The second point is, it is very difficult to find exomoons. We have to put this in consideration. Generally, to find an exomoon, you need to detect any va va variations on their host exoplanets we will understand this. Now, there are two questions about two candidates of exomoons, the Kepler 1625bi, B, if it contains the exomoon, which is I, and the Kepler 1708b as well. So those are the most two exomoons uh, candidates. But uh, till now, we have no confirmed exomoons yet. Where do we observe? In our galaxy. This is where we usually observe. And the most of most uh, the area that we observe through is this area among the galaxy, which is estimated to about 100,000 light years across. This is uh, supposed to be our solar system. And here, almost the stars that we see naked eye. Uh, by naked eye, and here is where usually we search for exoplanets. Uh, usually, when we observe, when we talk about exomoons, we have to to have first an exoplanet to search for. Uh, this is maybe a very well known slide for most of you, which talks about the habitable zone, which is a life zone uh, that which depends on how hot the star or the parent star is for uh, uh, cold stars like the the red 
uh, for the dwarf reds. Here you see the the there are here the the cold the uh, habitable zone. The green here is close to the planet. However, here it is cold. Here in this star, which is hot star, we see the warm area is extended to the the cold area for this star, which is a good area or just habitable for a medium star like the sun. So this is very important to, to know when we say, when we talk about habitable or life zone, when we say if, if a planet or an exoplanet, an, exo, an exomoon or exoplanet in habitable area does not mean it has the same distance that the Earth does or has from the sun. We talk about its parent star and how much hot the parent star is. Now here is the different projects, the ground-based observations, observatories that observe that detect exomoons, exoplanets, and here also uh, some of these uh, orbital telescopes are well known, like Hubble, uh, Spitzer, uh, also Kepler, the TESS. They recently uh, launched, not very recently, maybe more recently uh, is. Uh, is the web gems. So all of these, most of these actually uh, uh, maybe are, uh, they have uh, part, part of their functions is to observe uh, exoplanets or some of them actually like TESS is completely uh, exoplanet detector. Uh, this is uh, Kepler, uh, projects, uh, this part of a previous presentation about exoplanets, I'm not going that uh, far in that, but let me tell, till today, we have found about 5,000 exoplanets uh, in, 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 in our galaxy, about four, which is 4,935 4, exactly. And there are thousands also of candidate exoplanets. I still talk about exoplanets, remember. And here are actually the, sorry, I have to remove these before because I use these for another reason. Now I need to remove these. These are the methods that we actually use. Also this one has to be today. I, this is a previous presentation, but the number numbers are here are correct. So we have found this number of exoplanets, confirmed exoplanets, and the different methods, these are the methods to detect exoplanets. The transit, we found about 3,780 exoplanets by this method, which actually uh, based on occultation and eclipsing, when the planet comes in front of, the, of, the, of its parent star. Uh, and the radial velocity also, which was which actually the method that we found the first exoplanet, ever, first ever exoplanet in 1995 uh, by uh, Michael Meyer and uh, Dider Kolles, uh, Kilos. Those are the, the astronomers who actually only three years ago, they got the Nobel Prize because of the discovery of their uh, exoplanet that time, sorry. And uh, the third method is microlensing, uh, direct uh, Im uh, image, uh, image, uh, imaging, imaging, and uh, pulsar timing, astrometry, and some other. Uh, there's a number of different methods, more than actually these, those what I wanted just to show in this slide. I will now spend about one minute for, uh, to understand every method before we go for the for the exomoons and and this one which is the transit very simple if, if you have a star just like what happens to our star the sun when mercury and venus uh, transit or come front or eclipse and and some uh, sometimes we call it some kind of eclipse uh, but not total of course because that is very small compared to the disk of the sun now uh, once they come in front of the star what happens is the brightness of the star depths very, very, very slightly. If we could measure that small depth, uh, depth of, uh, of brightness of the star, then 
we can actually uh, calculate, do some calculation and analysis to find uh, to find out whether if we are discovering or detecting an exoplanet. The the bigger the the, the planet, the bigger the the depth it actually uh, it, it causes for the light uh, uh, for the light curve. Light curve, okay. This is actually a graph to tell us how the light curve would look like. In, in case of a planet comes front of the of its parent star uh, and by actually comparing the disk of the star and the planet or or the the depth will find the disk the 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 comparison or the the percentage of the diameter of the planet itself and uh, also the the distance here can tell us also something about the uh, uh, many, I mean, you see here, many parameters can be actually found uh, by uh, studying uh, the uh, every single parameter in in in, in this uh, light curve. Here you see a real light curve for uh, one of the exoplanets. Uh, these are the observations, and this is the light curve. And you actually that actually tells uh, about uh, discovery of one of the exoplanets. Uh, the other way is uh, radio velocity. Uh, this is actually uh, star wobbling or what we call Doppler effect. Uh, how that works here? How that works here? You have a star, and here a planet orbits the star. The star uh, dominates the, the, all the planets, including this one, to, to orbit around it. But because the planet is having some amount of mass, which is not zero, some amount which is very, very small compared to the mass of this of the star, then it will cause some motion, uh, circular or wobbling motion. As you see, uh, the, the star would actually do something like dancing or wobbling around the center of mass. The center of mass, of course, will be very, very, very close to the center of the parent star, and that actually would be uh, would vary be, be, depends on how massive the planet is and how close the planet is to its parent star. This is uh, the 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 first method that led to discover the first planet, as I mentioned, in 1995. Here, what happens, how to take that? By Doppler effect or by red and blue shift. Here is how, uh, if, if from our observ observ observatory from the Earth, we see how the uh, light, uh, uh, the, the absorption li lines of the light that can be detected by spectro spectro graphs can be actually uh, move can can move towards the the left when the uh, planet come closer uh, or to uh, or to red or to blue when the planet uh, goes further of course we don't talk about the planet we talk about the sun because this the light of its parent star the opposite uh, happens to the sun when the planet come close the sun would go far which gives actually red jet uh, red jet when the planet uh, travels away uh, fr uh, going away from us towards the the, the sun the, or its parent star then we get uh, the, the the star would come closer us that's a, a blue shift actually the third uh, uh, method for discovering or detecting exoplanets is micro lensing this is uh, the einstein's uh, result uh, or gravitational lens by einstein or sometimes we call it einstein's ring light uh, we will see this how this works here if you have a star very far star for example here and bright and for some reason another star comes in front of it of, of of this star what happens because of the gravity of the red star the the yellow star would look brighter 
actually we observe this one that what we are focusing on in our telescope you see the the light here comes very high at the moment when the red star comes in front of it because of the 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 uh, lens effect here is the light of the front one and here is the light of the 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 further uh, star it comes uh, bright uh, actually it brights uh, in in period of time usually two or three days depends on on uh, on that uh, what happens is this is normal and, and very well known but what ha would happen if the star at the front is having a planet orbiting it what happens is we see another another rays of light in the light curve that actually this is i call it now this actually is uh, is what uh, uh, actually uh, tells what tells us about uh, existence of uh, an exoplanet orbiting this star so this star is just something like uh, a screen but this one is what we are detecting here the star and it's uh, it's uh, exoplanet and this is very normal but this is the small rise in light is what tells us about the existence of the planet exoplanet there uh, another method actually which is the direct uh, photography or uh, imaging uh, by by sometimes telescopes and actually mostly by by uh, uh, telescopes with uh, with coronagraph, uh, this is we don't have many as you see only 58 cases by which we discovered uh, 58 exoplanets. Uh, Famulhut B is the most uh, famous uh, one. What was discovered by Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and uh, this these are some pictures for different uh, images that have been taken. Four stars. The star should be behind this one, actually. And here is the 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 planet. Here you see it here by blocking. We block the star itself. We don't see the star. Yeah, just in this graph. Yeah, uh, these graphics. But the star is is blocked here by the disk, which is this is why you corona graph. Actually, it's called corona graph. Uh, and the, the one the same one that we use when when we when we uh, take photographs for the sun, the corona around the sun in, yeah. in the solar eclipse. Uh, here also another method, which is the pulsar timing. <laughs> the pulsar uh, timing, uh, which detects the variation in the, the, the pulsar signal that we receive the radio signal we receive from pulsars the, the dead stars uh, if there is a planet uh, orbiting that uh, dead star pulse, pul pulsars then that signal would actually uh, change would would show the the effect of, of being uh, vibration actually uh, between the sun between the planet and and the this dead star uh, this is one of the most important uh, exoplanets have been discovered by 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 this way or this method it was discovered by arecibo the uh, collapsed observatory uh, two years ago you know it now uh, the astrometry is direct observation actually in the sky we observe the, 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 the star. When the star actually orbits uh, a planet, uh, that, uh, sorry, when a planet orbits this, a star, what happens is this, the, the wobbling itself uh, actually can be sometimes detected by observation, not only by radial velocity. This is uh, actually for, for one case. And this very, very, very small area in the sky, if you see here, the right ascension and the declination, by by micro uh, arc seconds you see here very small area in the sky and you need of course uh, very precise and special telescopes to detect those small variations in, in motion star stellar motions 
okay, there's some statistics about exoplanets. I'm not going that far here because we have to talk about exomoons now. Uh, let's go here. This is a good tree if you actually uh, take a chance to see it. All methods uh, that lead, lead to discovery of exoplanets discovery and sometimes even exomoons. This, for example, this one can lead to exomoon. So uh, it is a good one. I updated this myself. So I'm not sure if you can find uh, similar to this uh, directly. And then if you read it, I can maybe publish it myself. Okay, now let's talk about exomoons detecting. But what we need to think about and put in consideration for detecting exomoons, first, as I mentioned, we have discovered, we have in the solar system 220 moons. 20 moons are round among them. Uh, 340 moons orbit uh, minor uh, solar system objects. And small moons orbit uh, asteroids. Like this case, you see it. And also, if we look at the ratio, diameter ratio between the planet and the moon, you see for the Earth, it is about uh, fourth, uh, one fourth or, or 20, uh, 0.27 compared to the Earth. So the diameter of the moon is about 2.7, the diameter of the Earth. For Neptune, the, the largest one is too small as you see, is 0.05 Neptune's diameter. Titan, uh, compared to, the, to its parent uh, Saturn, it's 0.044. Jupiter, even less. Ganymede is the, the smallest planet, which is about uh, 0.03 of Jupiter's diameter. You see our case here, the moon is really strange in the solar system. So we have to put this in consideration, uh, which means the closer the planet if, if got uh, uh, moons, maybe they would be uh, large enough to be uh, to keep uh, there. Why? We'll see later. Here, this means what? Uh, there is an absence of moons uh, in the closer planets. Mercury does not have any moon. Venus, too. Why? Okay. So what is the, the, the definition? The definition of a planet, also we have to define a planet before, uh, before announcing that we have discovered a moon. Why? Because uh, some planets uh, actually come at the, at, the, uh, at the limit of being a star or planet. So we have to define what a planet is. So for, for the planets, you see here, if the planet is less than 0.013 uh, of the solar mass, of the object is, is less than that, then it is considered to be a planet. Why? Because there is no uh, fusion, deuterium fusion. Once the deuterium fusion starts, that starts actually above uh, 0.013 of the solar mass for objects that having uh, a, ma a mass above this, actually, they would start a fusion uh, for between this number, this number, then we get deuterium, and here helium can be actually uh, fused. Uh, so uh, if the object is less than this, then it can be considered to be a planet, regardless whether if it is orbiting uh, a living star or orbiting a dead star like Pulsar. So we have to put this in, in account, and that is called actually uh, uh, brown dwarf planets. Why we, we need to do to, uh, to put this in consideration? Because if there is um, uh, something orbiting this object, then we can call it an exomoon. Now, for extrasolar uh, planets, Orbiting within their stellar habitable zone, there is a, a, a prospect, a terrestrial planet-sized satellite. 
يعني if there is if we have a star here and this is the habitable zone and we have here uh, which is uh, cold in, in general not not hot not very cold here uh, and if we have a, an object here a terrestrial object uh, at the earth size for example so when, then we can ask ourselves uh, is there life there or not why because the parent planet is uh, lies or orbits its twin star in the in the uh, habitable zone in this one we usually because it's gas this one is gas we actually don't think about whether we're having life or not uh, but here uh, the question becomes even more uh, more uh, practical or efficient here uh, for exomoons uh, generated for uh, generated sorry just a minute here oh uh, yeah uh, for impact generated moons of terrestrial planets close from their star just like the 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 case in our uh, earth moon uh, now we have two options if the if the uh, planet if if the moon is very far from its parent planet then we see the planet the, the moon is uh, not tilted will be at the same plane that the the planet orbits its parent star why because of the tidal tidal uh, forces from the star but if the planet if the exomoon is too close to its planet then the planet dominates more than the sun does and then it can keep its uh, tilting uh, orbital uh, orbit around its planet for uh, when you have your moons orbit uh, gas giants the orbits of moon will tend will tend to be aligned with the giant planets. So when you see a giant uh, a gas uh, planet, then it's more likely to find the exomoon if it is there, if any, to be actually aligned with, with the disk uh, by which the planet was formed. This is also a hint when you observe or detect an exomoon. Okay, now, Planetary, planetary uh, migration actually is uh, influencing exomoon's migration. Maybe Muhammad Dhani is the best to tell us about planetary migrations. Maybe also there's another topic you can add in the future. And that actually would lead to exomoon's fate. How? Uh, either the moon would actually uh, collide with the planet if it comes be, uh, closer, the Roche uh, limit, or uh, uh, or it can actually uh, explode to make rings. So we have something called exo rings as well in this case. So we have to think this way when we observe in, uh, exo moons. So we, we, we might find exo rings as well. Okay, now. Uh, observing uh, uh, exomoons, this is just uh, we, we, we mentioned, just we would like to start from here to find out how to detect exomoons. Now, methods for detecting exomoons, uh, we will uh, see the different ones, the direct uh, imaging. Direct imaging, uh, it's very difficult even for the planet itself. But what if the exomoon is generating uh, hot heat, some heat, some kind of heat, because of the tidal forces that actually uh, influenced by its uh, giant parent star, like the case of Jupiter and Io, for example, its uh, closest moon. So this is, if this is Jupiter, you see Io orbiting Jupiter. What you see here is, the tidal forces is actually uh, is, is squeezing the planet itself. See, this is a point, it's not a planet. This is, the, the, this is not the moon. This is the moon actually. And here you see 
the, the, the one point on the planet, how to, to just to analyze the, the motion, what happens to the planet. So you see it is, uh, is, is squeezed uh, to, uh, uh, or extend uh, towards the planet. And that would actually generate a lot of heat inside the, the moon. If that happens, then we see volcanoes. If the volcanoes are very hot, then if we detect infrared from uh, a planet, from uh, a, a giant planet, from a certain point from a giant planet, this actually is uh, uh, an evidence, uh, could be an evidence of an exomoon is there and uh, sending or radiating uh, infrared uh, because of this heat here. Yeah. So this is one of the things that we can also uh, by, uh, by photography. Micro lensing as well, pulsar timing, uh, transit timing effect, a transit me method as well, and radial velocity. Let's see how that would help us to observe. Uh, radial velocity is, uh, will not work. Why? Well, now we'll see why radial velocity, which works perfectly for exoplanets, that would not work nicely if we talk about exomoons. Why? Again, here, the same uh, slide you saw about exoplanets. Uh, but once, if you have now here a planet, a single planet orbiting the star with no moons, and this one actually have a moon orbiting this planet, what will happen? You see here the same effects, the same red and the same blue shift. Why? Because they both together consider to be one mass, not two masses, one mass, and because of the, the center of the mass to the parent star, they are considered as just one mass, and that would not actually do, uh, influence to any changes in the, uh, on the red or blue shift in the Doppler effect. And uh, this is not the best method to detect exomoons, actually. So we either actually uh, look at the star itself, and this is not possible. But if we look at the planet, the exoplanet itself, now uh, it is not uh, an excellent idea because very faint and full of noise, the, 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 the signal we get uh, and low resolution. So this case is very difficult. So we usually ignore it at least with the technologies and techniques we have right now. Some other way to detect exomoons actually is uh, maybe we can do it here in, in at SAST maybe, if, uh, why? Because we already here, we have observatories, radio observatories. Uh, one of them is observing the signals the, uh, coming from uh, Io and Jupiter. Uh, this one actually uh, is, uh, is, is, is very important. Why? Because, because of the solar winds uh, and the magnetic uh, field of, of Jupiter, uh, there is an area around, around Jupiter called Blasmaya. And once planet, uh, the, the moon actually orbits the, the, planet, the planet in through this area, that will actually disturb the, the, the signal that we, re we receive. It is uh, decametric, actually, and Muhammad... Uh, Rihan and of course, Dr. Mashur, and Dr. Elias are experts in this one, and they can tell much better than me about uh, what happens between Io and Jupiter. So if we have a similar case, that means the signal itself will, will not be straight all the way, but it will be actually some disturbance will, will occur in the, in the signal. That's because something is breaking the, 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 the signal that could be an exomoon orbiting that planet. In our case, we can see Io, but uh, in uh, other cases, the exoplanets, we cannot see even the planet itself. And, but in, by this way, we can uh, sometimes detect an exoplanet, a possible an exoplanet uh, orbiting the exo, uh, sorry, exomoon orbiting the exoplanet that we observe by dec decametry. So this radio, this is an excellent one. Also by method by detecting exo, exomoons is 
uh, is by microlensing. This is very, very beautiful one. So let's, uh, to understanding, again, here we have a star and we have very far star and we have a, a closer star moving in front of it. Once it, it moves, we have here the light curve for both the same. But once it comes in front, because of the gravitational lens effect, we see the light of the farther star is getting riser, just like a lens. But what if this star is having an exoplanet? Then when this actually passes here in front of, of the star, what happens is we see another, another rays uh, rising in the, in the light curve here, or nail here, as you see, because of this one now. But what if the planet itself is having another object orbiting it, which is the moon, what would happen then? What would happen is we have another smaller nail of light raising up. If you, found, if you find this curve, uh, if you receive this curve or light curve for, uh, for, for, for uh, an object in, in this method, then that is a big evidence of discovering an exo moon here. This is the exoplanet and this is the exo moon. Yeah. This is very, uh, very, very simple or very uh, understanding, understood uh, method. Let's go here. And here a method of detecting exoplanets, we have pulsar timing. And uh, this is similar actually to the way we discover exoplanets, but we can also detect exomoons uh, in the same way. Uh, it is too complicated to go for every uh, for for that. Here also timing, a transit timing effect. Uh, uh, if we have a planet here, the star, and here the planet, and orbiting exomoon, uh, you see here again. The, the, the line, the, the, the light curve by when, when sorry, when the light, when, when the, this number one, number two, uh, you see here the, the depth of the exo uh, planet. Here you see another dip here, when the planet finished, you see another dip here, small dip for that actually is, uh, is for the exoplanet itself, exomoon. So we have now a system of planet and exomoon together. The big dip is for the planet, and this one is caused by the exomoon here. By uh, measuring the variation here, the timing variation or duration variation, the duration, uh, this is the timing, and, and when that comes again, that's the duration means, then you can tell uh, if that is an other, another exoplanet or an exomoon orbiting the planet. We have to we have to find this before. Uh, these also some light curves, real light curves taken by Kepler K K two actually. Uh, you see here. Uh, let me go directly to uh, transit five directly. This actually is how to analyze and calculate for the different uh, depths here. Uh, for uh, discovering exo uh, planets here, not exo exo moons. Uh, two the uh, two candidates uh, are there now. One of them actually is uh, now. I think it is not applicable, uh, which is uh, which is uh, here uh, sixteen Kepler sixteen twenty five, but seventeen o eight is is more actually acceptable to be an exomoon. Now the summary, I know it took long uh, time. There are more than 220 moons in our solar uh, system. Therefore, exomoons could be very common in the universe. Uh, it is very difficult, again, to discover or detect exomoons. We have not found any confirmed exomoon yet. This one could be an exomoon. Also, the recently candidate 1708bi also can be a, uh, an exomoon. Uh, generally, to find an exomoon, we have to take the variations in its uh, uh, parent exoplanet. Uh, and thank you very much. Hello, anybody is there? 
السلام عليكم Yes, Dr. Elias, are you here? Yes, I am here. So I wanted you to take over, Aisha. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Marwan, for this wonderful presentation. We learned a lot. It was a new topic indeed for me. And uh, I think now we can take some questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? Helmin Su'al. عليكم السلام تفضل آه، عندي سؤال بخصوص اكتشاف الكواكب اللي تدور حول حول النجوم آه، وياكم تميم التميمي آه، هل هل يعني هل بالامكان ان نحن كهواء نستكشف الكواكب او نحتاج الى معدات خاصه ولا دراسات خاصه حتى نقدر نكتشفها ونحن مثلا قاعدين تعرفي مثلا في محيط البيت او حتى مثلا نطلع في اماكن بعيده مثلا. وهذا سؤالي هل بالامكان نحن كهواء نكتشف مثل هالامور ام انها صعبه تحتاج الى وكالات فضاء كبيره يعني. شكرا لكم وجزاك الله خير على هالفرصه الطيبه. شكرا اخي تميم على السؤال. الحقيقه انه نكتشف كواكب نجميه اكزو بلانيتس مقصود فيها واحد من اثنين إما نستخدم معدات ونرصد مباشرة ونحلل المعلومات التي رصدناها لعادة لايت كيرف هذا المنحنى الضوئي كما شرحنا هذا اللي مثل أمامنا هذا هنا مثلا وإما هنا يعني أقصد وإما أن نأخذ الديتا الجاهزة والمرفوعة على الإنترنت الآن من من أجهزة ما اشتغلت لسنين طويله مثل كابلر مثلا تلسكوب كابلر الذي توقف عن العمل 2018 واللي ترك لنا ارث هائل جدا من الديتا ويمكنك اذا حللت هذه الديتا او من غيره طبعا في كثير مصادر من تس مثلا تلسكوب ومن غيره طبعا ومراصد ارضيه اخرى اذا حللتها قد تكتشف انت كوكب نجمي خارجي اكسو بلانت كيف تفعل ذلك في طرق معينه وليست بالصعبه لكن ما يحدث الان الحقيقه انه انه هاي الاشياء توضع في خوارزميات ويتم عاده اكتشافها باسرع من تدخل الهواء شوي يعني لكن بعض الهواء يقومون هم ايضا بعمل هاي الخوارزميات ربما ما تسال عنه ربما يكون منطبق اكثر او ينطبق اكثر على اكتشاف الاسترويدز او الكويكبات في النظام الشمسي حيث انهم يت... يعني المعلومات بنشروها وبوزعوها على الهواء وقلنا تفضلوا اشتغلوا اعملوا اناليسينج وبدون ما يتدخل حد يعني اكثر من هذا المستوى مستوى هواء وبيكتشفوا مباشره يعني فيمكنك فعل ذلك يعني ففي في الجانبين ممكنين حلو جزاك الله خير ما قصر دكتور الله يبارك فيكم وفي المكتب طبعا الاولى صعبه الاولى بدها تفتح الاولى مثل ما شرحت جبارة صح. ارضيه او بدها ايضا يعني اوربيتال تلسكوب تدور حول الشمس او حول الارض او احيانا حتى حول الشمس مثل كم آه. احيانا اما الباقي اللي هي نقدر البيانات الموجوده متوفره نقدر بعدين نعم نقدر تحليل البيانات وهي متوفره يعني. بالمناسبه ايضا اسمح لي اكمل انه بتحليل بيانات هذه الموجوده حاليا يمكنك ان تكتشف اكزوموز اذا تكلمت عنه انا الان واللي شفناه هون في هذا في هذا المكان قد تجده في بعض المنحنيات المتروكه بعضها ترك ما حد يعني انتبه لها لهي انتبه لهذه ولم ينتبه لهذه الصغيره فربما انت تكتشف اكزومون او انذر بلانيت بس بحاجه لدوره اخرى عشان تشوفها وهذا صعب في التلسكوبات الفضائيه بدها تلسكوبات تاكيد تلسكوبات ارضيه تو بي كونفيرم يعني لكن ممكن على الاقل تقول هذا كانديديت اذا عملتها انت واكتشفت هذا بصفي كانديديت ومرشح وبحاجه الى تاكيد لا تاكيد شو داي ريبيت ان انجلش عايشه ولا كيف؟ اعتقد لا باس يعني القليل من العربي القليل من الانجليزي يلا اوكي لا باس طبعا يبدو في سؤال اخر من وكاله علوم ونجوم رافع ايده او ايدها السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله نشكر الاستاذ الشويكي على المحاضره القيمه حقيقة عندي سؤال سبقني به الأستاذ تميم أو جزء من سؤالي سبقني به الأستاذ تميم 
استاذ مروان ذكرت في حديثك انه الاشعاع اللي يصدر من النجوم او الكواكب البعيده اللي تدور حول نجوم معينه بغض النظر عن الشعاع ممكن انه نرصد شعاعها بغض النظر عن الشعاع ممكن انه نحصل التردد الكهرومغناطيسي نعرف تردد اشقد من الارض او هذا يعني بالنسبه للنجوم البعيده تحديدا يعني ممكن قياس الترددات الكهرومغناطيسيه حتى نستدل عليها مثل الرادارات اللي يعني المراصد الراداريه نعم شكرا للسؤال طبعا احنا يجب الا نخلط ما بين النجم الاب اللي هو المضيف للكوكب والكوكب نفسه وايضا القمر الذي يدور حول الكوكب نفرق بينهم في سلوك مختلف النجوم هي التي تشع عاده الاشعاعات الضوئيه المرئيه والكهرومغناطيسيه بعمومها التي ترصد اما بالعين او باجهزه التحت الحمراء او اجهزه الفوق البنفسجيه والراديو للاقل طاقه وهكذا النج الكوكب عادة لا يشع الكواكب لا ترسل عادة طاقة هي تعكس فقط شيئا من الطاقة التي تستلمها من نجومها التي تدور حولها ولكن بالنسبة لما ذكرت أنا أخشى أنه هذا الجزء اختلط أنه بعض الأقمار الأكزومونز أنه يمكن أن تشع بذاتها فعلا في حالتين هي إذا كان الكوكب العملاق يضغط بقوى الجذب التايدل فورسز او نسميها المد والجزر قد انها تحرك داخل الكوكب وبالتالي تصنع حراره هائله تتولد عليه على شكل براكين وحراره على السطح اذا رصدنا باجهزه الانفراريد تحت الحمراء هذه الحراره هذا الضوء القادم من قرب نجم من قرب كوكب اكزو بلانيت مكتشف وثابت فربما نحن نتكلم عن وجود اكزومون يدور حول هذه واحده كما يحدث بالنسبه للاي او القمر اي او والمشتري الثاني الان انه في الديكاميتريك راديو اوبزرفيشن وهذا بنعملها هون في الاكاديميه والدكتور الياس كما ذكرت والاخ محمد خبراء وبيعملوا حتى بيبرز في الموضوع بخصوص المشتري وقمره اي او لانه في هناك في مستوى ال 10 سم ديكاميتريك اوبزرفيشن فهذه اشاره طبيعيه من المشتري بسبب السولار وينز وال وال والتداخل مع الفيل الماجنت فيل الان هذا اذا في قمر هناك مثل ايو وهو يدور يشوه هذه الاشاره يعني كانه بيعمل بلوك وبيشوه تشويه في الحركه هذا التشويه نستلمه على شكل انه اشاره غير منسجمه لماذا يضيعنا الاشاره حقيقيه ولماذا في دوره في في التشويه ايضا هناك في سايكل فلماذا؟ فهذا بيدل على وجود احنا بنعرف اصلا وجود ايو نفسه، لكن اذا اكتشفنا مثل هذا عند كوكب خارجي بعيد اكزو بلانيت فنحن ربما نتكلم او نتكلم عن وجود اكزو مون يدور حوله، وهذه قصدتها بالاشارات. غير هيك شكرا جزيلا استاذ شكرا آه. جزيلا استاذ الله يحييك اي سؤال اخر؟ آه Uh, Mr. Marwan, I checked the chat box. There are no questions. They're okay. just thanking you, and uh, they seem to be very happy with this presentation. And so are we. So Shukran. thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran ilkum. Shukran. Salaamu alaikum.